So thanks again for joining us. My name is Karen Corman, and I have the privilege of being the Executive Director of the UIC Alumni Association. Welcome to the UIC Alumni Exchange Series. Through the UIC Alumni Exchange Series, we work to bring our alumni and friends a variety of programs and topics so you can explore, connect, and even escape from the everyday with a community of UIC alumni, faculty, and staff experts. You'll hear me say this a few times today, and we'll go ahead and chat this, but I encourage you to visit go.uic.edu slash alumni exchange for the latest and greatest programming. And with that, I'm excited to start our program today as we are joined by UIC alumnus, Dr. Dr. David Mayer. We are grateful Dr. Mayer is here to share his unique stories of walking across America. He is passionate about making medical care safe for patients and set out to bring attention to this topic. He was fighting cancer at the time while we were all experiencing a worldwide pandemic and social unrest. Dr. Mayer is an avid Cubs fan, and he stopped at over 20 major league, three minor league, and 14 spring training ball parks along the way. We're very excited to learn more about the topic and hear about his many stories. Thank you so much, Dr. Mayer, for being with us here today, and I'll turn it over to you to begin the program. Well, thank you, Karen, and uh, greetings to my uh, fellow alumni. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today and share a little bit about uh, what I've been doing the last year or so to keep busy during some of the, the most challenging times I think we've all experienced in our lifetime. So I, I welcome the opportunity to share a little bit about my work and, and why I did what I did um, last year. There we go. So yes, I did a walk across America trying to raise awareness about uh, not only the safety of the health system for our caregivers, our people at the front line, but for patients who are unintentionally but preventably harmed many times. A little background about me, as you can see, I didn't realize there was a state border. So I stayed in Illinois for my undergraduate, for my medical school. I did my residency at Michael Reese and then ended up becoming a, a physician at the University of Illinois where I oversaw the cardiac anesthesia group. I had a special interest in healthcare safety going back to the mid to late 80s. And that also um, affected my career at the University of Illinois. I had the job of, along with Tim McDonald, being the director of the uh, UIC Institute for Patient Safety Excellence, where we tried to find uh, you know, ways to make healthcare safer. Um, I also was the academic dean at the University of Illinois Medical School, and I'm proud to say we had, one, we had the first four-year curriculum in quality and safety for medical students uh, in the country back in 2005, 2006, because we all felt that teaching safety at an early age was very important in the career of our, our young healthcare leaders. So I've had a uh, wonderful career through the years at the University of Illinois. I did uh, go on and become the executive director of the MedStar Institute of Quality and Safety, which is a large health system, which I'll talk about before I finally um, started to try to take it easy a little bit. I volunteer my time also as the CEO of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. It's a global organization, as you can see. It's committed to zero preventable deaths by 2030. And, and we work with over 64 countries around the world, providing tools and different um, applications that allow the caregivers at the front line to provide safer, higher quality care through evidence-based practice. As I mentioned, uh, I was, uh, brought out to MedStar Health on the East Coast. It's the largest uh, academic, largest health system, bigger than Hopkins, bigger than University of Maryland. We have 10 hospitals, including Georgetown and uh, MedStar Washington Hospital Center. You can see over 30,000 associates. And uh, my job now is I, I lead the uh, MedStar Institute for Quality and Safety, where we do research and innovation and education around quality and safety for healthcare providers. <laughs> You know, many people aren't aware, but we do have a preventable medical harm crisis in this country. And I you like this quote so much to frame exactly why I do what I do for the last 25 years or so and why I did my walk. Medicine used to be simple in effect and relatively safe. Now is complex, effective, but potentially dangerous. 30 years ago, 
if you had high blood pressure, you'd go see your internist, you'd get a medication, you'd go home. A week later, you get your blood pressure checked. If it worked, great. If it didn't, you try another medication. It was simple, but at times maybe not as effective as we wanted. Today, we are doing some amazing things in healthcare. We are curing cancers that we thought uncurable 10 years ago. People have been living longer. People are living um, and going through procedures that are minimally invasive, procedures that you'd be in the hospital for seven days, just 15 years ago, now you have as an outpatient. So we're doing tremendous work in improving the outcomes of disease states, but it hasn't come with some intrinsic dangers to it, uh, which I'll talk about. The problem over the last 20 years has been normal. There's been numerous research done, including by the Institute of Medicine, showing that estimates range that patients who go into the health system for whatever illness or treatment they need, over between 100,000 and 400,000 die preventably due to mistakes, due to breaks or gaps in care that are done unintentionally. The recent report that came out of Johns Hopkins the British Medical Journal estimated that 251,000 people die from preventable medical harm when they've entered the health system. Well, what, is, what does preventable medical harm mean? Um, well, I can tell you in, in my career many years ago, I was involved in a wrong-sided surgery. We still have over 2,000 wrong-sided surgeries today. You go in for a right knee arthroscopy, and for some reason, a breakdown in communication, busyness, distractions, the incision is made on your left knee by mistake. We're doing things to correct those things, but that's one form of error. Getting the wrong medication or the wrong dose of medication still is a big area where we see mistakes being made. Hospital acquired infections. We still have too many infections when people come in to have procedures, be it an eye procedure, a knee procedure, we're improving, but not at the rates that we need to, to lower those numbers. And then one other category is delayed diagnosis, misdiagnosis, a lab result wasn't acted on at the time it should have been, and thus a patient ends up with sepsis and uh, potentially dies because we didn't know that the white blood cell count or something else was elevated and had to be treated. So there's numerous types of ways that hair can break down while you're being treated. And the pandemic has only made this worse, especially for healthcare workers. You can't pick up a newspaper or a social media post today without reading about what the workforce has gone through over the last 18 to 24 months. Thousands, three, four thousand caregivers at the front line have died while being, while trying to take care of people, but getting exposed to the virus and end up getting infected and dying from it, especially in the early part of the pandemic when we didn't have the right protective equipment. We weren't training people the way we needed to train them up quickly enough, and thus many died. People don't realize that even before the pandemic, healthcare workers had some of the highest suicide, depression, and burnout rates of any industry in this country. Injuries at the, at the front lines, we see it neck, needle sticks, lifting injuries, falls and slips of uh, our workers. And I, I will tell you, the amount of workplace violence has gone up tremendously since the pandemic started, three, 400 percent, where healthcare workers are being threatened or bullied or physically attacked while trying to take care of patients during these um, challenging times. So I really felt that there was something not only for the patient side, but for the health worker side that needed to be addressed. And you say, well, how come I'm a physician? When I was involved in a wrong-sided surgery many years ago, we didn't come to work to harm somebody. We come to work to heal, to do good. But our systems and processes are just set up that when we make a mistake, and it is this air is human, when you make a mistake, things do happen, unfortunately, to patients. And so you say, okay, how could mistakes happen? Well, I love this picture because it kind of shows 
that we're all human. And what aviation has done and other high-risk industries is they brought human factors, engineering, and system and process changes to try to trap these mistakes. I saw this being displayed by a good friend of mine, Raj Watwani, who's the head of our, our National Center for Human Factors Engineering. And I started laughing. I said, Rob, where'd you get those pictures of cars driving down the street with gas hoses hanging out of their tanks? And he said, Dave, there's a whole website of pictures. There's over a thousand pictures of cars driving down their street with gas hoses hanging out of their tanks. There's even police cars driving through their communities with gas hoses hanging out of their tanks. And I guarantee you, no one woke up that morning and said, I'm going down to the gas station and I'm going to pimp the owner. I'm going to drive away with their gas hose after I filled up. No, we get distracted. We forget things. We go inside, get a cup of coffee while you know, the car was being filled. And then we jump in and, and we're thinking about something else. Um, I've got a brother-in-law who owns a gas station. And he says it happens once a month. He keeps six extra hoses in a closet just to pop them back on when they get pulled away. But fortunately, the, um, the gas industry has figured out that you can't put a sign up on the pump saying, please don't dry away, drive away with our hose. It won't correct it because we are human. They put little pop-off valves so as the hose starts pulling away, it separates and shuts down the gas. So there's no gas that leaks out onto the gas station driveway and cause another potential big time danger. So we do make mistakes. And then we put our nurses, our physicians, our allied health personnel in situations like this and say, okay, don't make a mistake. Be careful, do the best you can. But unfortunately the systems and processes are so complicated and we haven't seen the improvements that we wanted. So. Last early February, I, for somebody who's been, you know, giving talks and presentations and moderating panels all across the world to health system leaders and to caregivers about ways that we could use tools and techniques that have been proven to reduce risk, how we can incorporate them in, into our health systems and hospitals. Many of us who've been doing these types of this type of work over the last 20 years. We're really frustrated because the data was showing we weren't making the improvements we had hoped. We were still seeing too many patients being unintentionally harmed. And as Einstein said, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, but expecting different results. So I said, enough with the presentations, enough with the lectures. I need to come up with something that's different, that's crazy, that's so absurd that maybe it'll draw attention to what we've been trying to raise awareness about, that the health system is not safe, not only for those that we care for, but those who do the caring for those patients. And then at the beginning of February, first week of February, 2020, I happened to be watching Forrest Gump on TV one night with my wife. We decided it was a good movie to watch. Hadn't seen it in a while. And I get to Forrest getting up off the couch and deciding to run across America. And I look at it and I think, wow, could this be the crazy, absurd idea? Could a 67-year-old physician walk across the country trying to raise awareness and gain the media attention like Forrest did? The media started following him, asking him, was there a mission? Was there a cause he was running across? And I, I couldn't run anymore. My knees had been shot from years of doing some marathons and half marathons. So I just said, but maybe I can walk across the country in doing so, I'd raise awareness about this, but I needed a hook because patient safety, healthcare worker safety hadn't been, the media hadn't found that interesting. So I decided as a, a longtime Chicago Cub and baseball fan that I would walk to all 30 major league ballparks on my way across the country and go in and visit, take in a baseball game. It was like a bucket list thing, and maybe that would be interesting to the media. So I started planning and got everything together. It's a picture of my right ankle on the left side of the screen you see. Um, I, was in, I was in Cleveland in 2016 when the Cubs game seven finally won the World Series with my youngest daughter. 
And, uh, you know, I was at all World Series games. I've been a long time Cubs season ticket holder. And four weeks after the game, my daughter got, sent me a picture that showed a tattoo on her ankle of the date and time the Cubs won the World Series. Now, I never had a tattoo in my life, but I thought that was so clever that I flew to Fort Lauderdale where she lives, went to her tattoo parlor, and that is the date and the time the ball hit Anthony Rizzo's mitt. And the Cubs ended up winning their first World Series in 2000, in 108 years, back in 2016. But then in late February, I started the walk and I went to San Diego Petco Park, my first baseball field. And I walked eight miles that day and, and ended up at the park. Now it was spring training, so the park wasn't open. But literally within two weeks after starting my walk, as we all know, the country started shutting down. First major league, um, you know, the NBA shut down and the National Hockey League shut down, soon followed by canceling a spring training. The NCAA canceled both the men's and women's March Madness championship tournaments, and then the country locked down. And I was out in California, so I ended up going back to Arizona where we had a second home to try to figure out what was gonna happen. What was the new world that we were living? So I started doing long walks in Arizona to generate it. And my original plan was to kick off my long walk across the country going from Milwaukee and American Fields homes, the home of the Brewers, to Wrigley Field, walking a hundred miles in seven days and taking in ball games at each of those uh, ballparks after San Diego and then continuing across the country. But with the pandemic, everything shut down. So what I ended up doing was I started walking long walks in Arizona, and I did a 10-day, 130-mile walk to all 10 Cactus League ballparks plus Chase Field while we were locked down during the pandemic. And I started getting some media coverage. This was the first article uh, in a local paper here back in April about what was going on. Well, lo and behold, after I finished that 10 day walk, my wife and I got in the car and said, we're going to start driving because uh, the pandemic and things shutting down. But despite the risks, we got in our car and proceeded from Phoenix, we went to Denver, we went to Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, Milwaukee, Detroit, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. We covered all these parks. We drove over 1,500 miles in 74 days, and at every major league ballpark city, I did long walks. Some of them were 100 miles over seven days. Some of them were 22 miles over two days. But in each of those towns I went to, I had patients and family members and caregivers who had lost loved ones due to preventable medical harm come out and start walking with me. So in Denver, we had a group of 30 of us that were walking, social distancing, and walked from Red Rocks Park down to Coors Field. Did the same thing in St. Louis and Chicago. We had a number of people who finally did my walk from Milwaukee down to Chicago, 100 miles over seven days um, with friends and family. And so everywhere I've walked in these towns, people knew I was coming there and would reach out and say, I wanna walk with you in memory of my daughter, in memory of my spouse. Here's some pictures that we went. The top left picture is Gabby Galbo. She died at the age of five due to um, a misdiagnosis. She had an infection that they sent her home and, and didn't treat. They had missed it. And three days later, she was dead from sepsis. Her parents, Tony and Liz Galbo, have been great friends of mine. And they came out and walked. And I stopped in Monticello, Monticello Illinois where Gabby's gazebo and we held a memorial service for her on the drive. This picture at the top middle is a wonderful picture of Armando Nyham and his mother, Esther, who when I came to Atlanta and walked to Truce Field, the home of the Atlanta Braves, they came out and walked with me. His mother is 89 years old and she walked seven miles with me and Armando. And then we did a memorial service for Josh Nyham Armando's son and her grandson, who again died from sepsis and uh, a delayed diagnosis and treatment. The picture up on the top right is a group of friends that came to Arizona and walked with me um, in Arizona over those 10 days and 130 miles. 
The picture at the bottom left is Jack Gentry. Jack suffered preventable medical harm during a surgical procedure that left him paralyzed from the neck down. Um, Jack has become a big patient safety advocate uh, before the pandemic was traveling literally with his wheelchair around the country giving talks about the importance of open and honest communication. Jack met me in Baltimore where he lives and we did a four mile, he did four miles of my 20 mile walk to Camden Yards, the last four in his wheelchair and, and three newspaper and TV stations interviewed both of us about the patient safety crisis. The middle picture as you can see Wrigley Field when we finished my first um, John to Wrigley Field from Milwaukee and, and the Brewers Stadium. The bottom right there is me being interviewed um, in Tampa Bay at Tropicana Park. Uh, there, there were four TV stations or radio stations that came out, wanted to know why the 67 year old guy was walking to empty ballparks in the middle of the summer in 95 degree heat and 100% humidity. Um, they found that very interesting during a time when they were looking for a good story. Every ballpark I walked in every place, city I went to, plus during my uh, walks in Arizona and Chicago and daily walks, I, I dedicated the walk in memory of somebody that I knew who had died from preventable medical harm or a health system that was stepping up and doing great work in patient safety. So, and I'd leave what we call memorial stones at each of the ballparks with names uh, written on them. The, the picture top right is Carol Hemmigarn and Vonda Baden-Bates. Uh, Carol lost her 11-year-old daughter due to preventable medical harm. Um, and again, misdiagnosis. Vonda lost her husband to um, a pulmonary embolus in something that should have been easily treated, um, but for some reason, her husband didn't get the treatment he needed and three days later, he had a pulmonary embolus that took his life. Both of them walked with me in Denver and, and were interviewed by the local media out there, the TV stations, again, sharing their stories. Bottom left is me again at Wrigley Field. We had four um, news and radio shows come out, plus the Chicago Tribune. And they're interviewing um, Dan Schwartz, Denny Schwartz, who was a, uh, I'm sorry, Brad Schwartz, who was a four- amputee survivor of sepsis. He walked the last mile and a half with us and then was interviewed on why he came out. Again, late detection of sepsis caused him to lose all four of his limbs. And then as a true uh, Chicago fan, although I love the Cubs, the Sox are my second favorite team. So when I walked to uh, the Sox Glendale Stadium in, in Arizona, their spring training camp, I wore my Walter Payton jersey because I wanted to be Chicago neutral and stuff and visited there. Um, needless to say, when I started walking, I didn't know what social media was, but everybody encouraged me to get a, get handles. So I got a Twitter and a uh, Instagram handle. Mine is walk for PT safety. And lo and behold, I found that over a thousand people within the first two months of my beginning my walk started following me and walking with me across the country. People in Australia, in London, in the Middle East, all across the U.S. And we had over 1,500 then start totaling their miles through an app we were using called Charity Miles. It's like, you know, Fitbit and, and some of the Stravas. And to date, we are now over 240,000 miles as a team, all walking to raise awareness about um, healthcare safety around the world. I did a DC walk naturally, and on uh, September 17th, which is World Patient Safety Day, um, I timed my walk so I could be in DC and walk 10 miles from Arlington National Cemetery hit all the memorials, the White House, Freedom Plaza, and then a group of us, uh, about 30 at the time, walked to the Capitol building and we were allowed to plant 2,000 flags on the lawn of the Capitol building, each one of them with the name of someone who had died from preventable medical harm, each flag representing 100 patients of the 200,000 plus who die every year from preventable medical harm. We had a number of congressional leaders come down and I was so honored 
when a couple of the congressional leaders took the flag off the top of the Capitol building that at the end of the day and wrapped it up and sent it to me as a token of their appreciation of what I was doing. This is a huge 12 foot by six foot US flag that uh, I will probably, that I probably display on our back fence on, on holidays during the course of the year. But something that really touched me a lot and I was honored that they would think of sending it to me that day. We had a team out in Newport Beach that did the same thing, walked along the beach again, raising awareness and planting flags for those lost due to preventable medical harm, trying to raise that awareness with the public. Well, February 19th, after starting 355 days later, I finished in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. I started literally with my toes in the water in San Diego the previous February when I um, put my feet in the water in the Pacific Ocean and then finished 2,460 miles later over those 355 days. And again, planted flags on the beach in Jacksonville Beach, Florida, in memory of those lost, as well as um, the patient safety movement made me a large um, mosaic of pictures of those that we have personally known whose families um, support and work with us to make care safer every day. As I kind of joked with people, walking across the country or doing what I did in any year would have been crazy as my wife continues to tell me and she reminded me every day. She just said, if, we hadn't, if I hadn't had that second glass of wine when I was watching Forrest Gump, I may have not come up with the silly idea. But walking during a year when this country has seen tremendous challenge made the walk even that much more interesting, relevant, and reflective for me. You can see the amount I walked, the amount of, we drove over 74 days. We were in 26 different states where we walked. I walked in many cities literally the day after we had the riots, the protests from Black Lives Matters and others. Um, the book that I'm writing about my experience, the title is Walking on Broken Glass, because it happened at least eight, nine days where I'd be walking through boarded up downtown areas in cities that were once vibrant, once, you know, full of people, and they were empty. And that was quite amazing. Um, I wore a mask because as was mentioned earlier by Karen, um, I was diagnosed with two cancers and was uh, being treated for them right when I started this walk and continue to go through some scans and updates to make sure all is well. But I was in a high risk industry and I wore a mask, the same mask I wore in the operating room for 25 years as an anesthesiologist and wear it eight, 10 hours a day. And I did it to protect my patients, to make sure they were safe. And yet, when I wore a mask for my own safety walking across the country, many times I was threatened. Many times I had people point fingers in my face and say, get that damn mask off, as if I was trying to make a statement other than trying to be safe at a time we weren't safe as a country and the pandemic was taking uh, over 700,000 lives. It was just a really experience of seeing the difference in states as I walked across the country that a mask had to become a political statement and not a safety statement. But I, I described those events. I will say, as I, I, I've told Karen and Jenna and, and others, um, for every bad experience or intimidating type event I had, I probably had over a hundred great experiences. People coming out of their homes, asking me what I'm doing, giving me bottles of water, bringing out towels to put on my neck when it was 100 degrees or, you know, I was just blown away by the kindness and generosity of people who, when they heard what I was doing, just jumped on and would walk with me for a half a mile and keep me company and, and say, you go, girl, you go, guy, you know, that sort of thing. I was just, it was just, and again, I talk a lot about that in the book, that despite those that try to separate us, there are hundreds more that try to bring love and unity to us as, as a country. Um, I did over 75 interviews, TV, newspaper, radio, uh, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, Bob Surratt in Chicago. And, you know, it was just so much fun. It allowed me to share my message. 
Um, I went through 12 pairs of running shoes. Thank God for Brooks, who were my, my previous running shoe um, source. When they heard what I was doing after I was about four or 500 miles into my walk, they started donating free shoes to me and I would take the cost of the shoes and donate it to the patient safety movement, but they were a big supporter. Um, as was mentioned earlier by Karen, I eventually got to 20 major league ballparks. I couldn't get to some because the pandemic just shut down cities. I had plans to go to New York and Boston and I couldn't travel there because they weren't allowing people in. I went to LA and, and to Anaheim and I was planning to go to San Francisco and Oakland. And I couldn't get up there because there was such craziness and fires and, and polarity at the time of the election that it just wasn't safe to go up there. But I did make it to 20 major league ballparks, 14 spring training ballparks, and three minor league ballparks all along the trek that I did. I raised over $50,000 for the patient safety movement, two broken toes, back spasms, hips and knee pains. Um, I probably went through it all, but uh, thank God for ibuprofen and, and uh, them making it happen. And then finally, I just wanted to share some thoughts because people say, well, what can we do as consumers? I'm not a physician, a nurse, I'm not in healthcare, but what could I do to either you know, protect myself or to protect loved ones um, when they do enter the health system? And I think the major thing I could share is be a partner in your healthcare. Be there, the, the, the care team, is there for you, you are not there for them. We put you in the center and we are all around you making sure we're meeting your needs. Make sure you feel that way when you go in and that you're a true partner and collaborator in your healthcare, that you're active and participating. Don't just say, okay, 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 ask questions. So first thing on the Patient Safety Movement Foundation website, there's a great tool called Patientator. It's a free app. You download it on your phone and it allows you to ask it questions. It allows, gives you information about certain x-rays or certain tests that maybe you're being, they're being recommended and you need to understand more about them. It, it's wonderful. Thousands of people are using it today across the world in making sure that they understand and getting their questions answered if their physician or somebody else was too busy to spend the time to answer those questions. A sentinel, this became very challenging during the pandemic, but we always encourage a family member to be there for their loved one, to be asking questions alongside, to be asking what type of medication is, what's the dose that you're giving my father? Again, I know the pandemic has made it very challenging because of visitation hours and things, but through Zooms and Skypes and others, Make sure if you have a loved one that's in the hospital that you're part of that team and you're asking questions to help protect that loved one. Ask questions, be a partner, get second opinions when big decisions are being made. Many times as, as physicians, we're not always right. We think we know the answers and, and we do our best, but sometimes there's something newer or something better that we're not aware of. So second opinions are important. Don't be bullied or intimidated. People sometimes feel asking too many questions is just going to turn off your care team or trying to get answers, to things you don't understand. Don't be bullied. Ask those questions again. And if you feel you're being bullied, take it up the chain and mention it to somebody um, in that hospital that you want different care or you want somebody else taking care of you. Medications, check them over and over and over again. Again, as I mentioned earlier, too many times we give you a medication and, and oh, that wasn't for you, that was for somebody else, or I don't know why I'm giving you your medication now, it's not due for another three hours. So medications are important. Use online patient portals. You have the ability now to get your records, to look at your medical records, to see what people are saying, to find test results that you maybe haven't gotten back from your physician or your health system yet. Use those patient portals. They're so good at providing information. And then other sites. Yet you're going in for a procedure and a certain physician was recommended. Check them out. Hospital Compare is the CMS website. 
It allows you to check one hospital versus another. Leapfrog does the same thing where they rate hospitals based on quality, safety, and outcomes from an A to an F. And you could understand which are the, some of the better hospitals and which have better outcomes. Um, again, there's many of these across the country now that allow you to not only rate and rank hospitals and understand, but also physicians and proceduralists. So those are important tips. And uh, I will stop there because I wanted to leave time for questions and, and some comments. So again, thank you for the opportunity to share what I did during my year locked down in the pandemic. Although I will say I, I was, wasn't was locked down and I dragged my wife all across the country, God love her, to try to do what we both believe and, and that's, safer care for all. Well, thank you, Dr. Mayor. This has been incredible. Um, so many different angles of things that you've talked about and just really touching stories. Thank you for sharing this and thank you for doing this. Um, we did have a few questions come in. Uh, let me start with, what are the top three safety measures families should look for in a care setting? Well, I think um, a lot of health systems have embraced what's called high reliability. You know, we've learned so much from like aviation about how they were able to make flying safe. Think about it. I mean, an airplane is a metal tube carrying about 150 people. It takes off, goes about 550 miles an hour and lands safely. And it does it over 36,000 times a day commercially. Well, they've learned to they uh, how to use certain tools. So some of the things that we believe, do they do safety rounds? Do they do team-based rounds? So if you go, if a loved one's in the hospital, are you seeing the physician one time, the resident the next time, the nurse the following time? Or do they come in as a group and say, we are here for you, including social work and others to make sure we're meeting your needs? Um, do they do double checks? When they come into the medication, do they ask you, to validate and verify, we call it, with them that, okay, what medication am I getting? You read to me what medication it is. I'll verify that that's the medication and the dose I should be getting and at the time. Those type of little things, and you can see it, you can sense it within a hospital versus ones that seem to rush in, rush out, and are very busy. So um, I, I think those are some great examples of hospitals. Do they really engage you? Before they leave the room, do they ask, is there anything I haven't answered? Or do you have any questions still about what's going to happen? Um, those things, uh, I think, are very important in a, defining a culture within a hospital. Thank you. I, th I would assume there might be a bit of a generational component to this, too. In my own personal experience, uh, certain people in my family will not ask questions, um, and other people of other generations are, have no problem asking a thousand and one questions. <laughs> That is that is so true. Um, my generation just seems to not want to ask as many questions. Yet you get the younger generations that not only do they ask questions, but then they're going on things where they rate their experience. And I've had some physicians come to me complaining that they said somebody posted on Yelp that they waited an hour in my waiting room to be seen. And I said, well, did they? He said, yeah, but you know, I was being, well, that's what, you know, that's what's happening today. People are, are voicing through these, you know, social media channels, what they think and what, how they rate physicians and nurses. And it's, I, I think it's great because it gets people to start paying attention to maybe things that they were taken for granted. It's, it's a different business model though, an adjustment I'm sure for many people. Um, mm -hmm. Another question that came in, how do you balance the need for awareness of preventable medical errors with the possibility of deterring people from seeking care? Well, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you have to, we need care. Care is, we do tremendous things. And I don't want to underestimate that but we need to raise this awareness. We need to make the public aware so they're asking the right questions, that they're aware that just because you go into a hospital doesn't ensure you're gonna be 100% safe. Um, look, I, you know, I've used healthcare all my life recently with my cancers and it was wonderful, 
But did I notice sometimes where there were lapses or things that I caught in breakdowns? It's good people just running fast, jumping high, trying to do too much without the resources they need. There are tools and techniques that could be implemented within healthcare. So I think there's just a balance. We don't want to scare people. We just want to make them aware. And when hospitals are made aware, when hospitals are, are questioned or the public starts demanding higher quality, safer care, hospitals respond and the government responds. We just need to do more of that um, because some of these stories, when families and patients, you saw some of the pictures of those, I, I don't know. I don't know if I could handle losing an 11 year old who went into the hospital and ended up dying due to preventable medical harm, things that should not have happened. And again, it wasn't because of a bad person or somebody just doing things against rules. It was because the systems and processes weren't put in place, technologies weren't invested in that could have made that 11-year-old safe and allow her to come home. Um, I've met too many people uh, that have lost those family members, and, and it's, it's a life-changing catastrophic event. So we need just to be aware that we enter the health system. We enter it with our eyes wide open and make sure that we're doing everything we can to work with those at the front line to make sure the care is safe. Well, and I heard you say earlier that with COVID and we know the pure exhaustion that's on our healthcare workers, oh, this is probably even more important now or there's more of a focus on it now uh, for people really to be paying attention and asking questions um, because there is just such a demand um, in it human is, It's so important. We, many of us in, in you know, the, the space I work in uh, feel we may have burned out a generation of nurses. We have such, we had such a nursing shortage before the pandemic and now nurses are leaving. Nurses are leaving the profession. They are tired, they are burned out. And um, it, it's just, it, it's just a shame because they're great people who come to work to heal. They went into the profession because they felt they had a calling and they're just so tired and burned out that they say, I just don't want it anymore. I just want to go home and after 20 years, I'm going to retire early or I'm just going to take a job in a, you know, a physician's office from eight to five and not work in the operating room anymore, not work in the ICU anymore. And we need that level of, of nursing talent in those high acuity areas. Well, and especially if that's coupled with people have been threatened in their roles and just as yeah. you said, people came up to you and had all sorts of opinions. Um, just how, you know, why would you want to put up with that for your own mental health? It's just, um, exactly. Uh, I don't know if you can pinpoint this, but the question that came is what were your best and worst experiences while traveling? Um, the best experiences truly were talking to people and meeting people along the way in different areas. And it, it really, um, it changed my perspective and, and some of my even internal biases and, and, and things. Um, I remember one time walking through some of the poorest areas in, in uh, downtown Phoenix as I was cutting from the East Valley to the West Valley and would be walking by these homeless villages, cardboard villages. Um, and every one of the people would like, hey, what are you doing? Hey, I ended up stopping and sitting and talking um, with many of them. They were all encouraging. They were, how oh, great, you know, you go. And I mean, it, it was something and in, in, in my inner thought said, oh, you know, I better be careful. This is a dangerous area. It turned out to be one of the most pleasant four block areas that I walked in, in covering. And, and they were all, to their credit, wearing masks and staying safe and sitting six feet apart while they were talking along the streets. But I just had a, a wonderful time. I had a gentleman come out of his home when we had uh, the back of our car. My wife served as a, a sag wagon sort of support. And so we'd put a cooler in the back of the car and every about four or five miles, she would be up ahead and I'd meet her and she'd pop the trunk up and, and I'd have a Gatorade and a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And this gentleman comes out from his home and he just says, are you okay? I saw the trunk up. Uh, you know, I want to make sure you were okay. I thought maybe you broke down. I'm a mechanic. And when we told him what we were doing, he goes, I got to get you bottles of water or at least a cold. We, you know, he was so friendly and nice. So 
Um, I think that those were the highlights of the trip and the people I met in all areas across the country. Um, going to the ballparks, even though they were empty, um, was an amazing experience for somebody who loves baseball. I remember going into Cleveland and walking to Progressive Field. It was just when the players had come back from the shutdown and they were going through what they call summer camp. So the Cleveland ball players were having batting practice within the ballpark and outside of the ballpark, the left field wall, I was sitting there and just listening to the crack of the bat against the ball. It was the first time I had heard it in four months. That was exciting. Um, going through, uh, the, I guess the scary parts were those intimidations where people, you know, literally, um, you know, would threaten us for wearing a mask. Um, and, and going through, again, during the pandemic, we went down to Miami and walked to Marlins Park during the time Miami was having the worst infection rates in the country. And my wife and I debated whether we would go from Tampa Bay and continue on and do the Miami portion of the walk. But we did it, but we tried to stay as safe as we could um, during those times. So it, it was really a mix of emotions. And, and I guess also it was, it was very depressing seeing the broken out windows and looted front stores and, and cities just, you know, being isolated, being just totally empty in cities that I knew. I mean, walking down Magnificent Mile in Chicago, never seen it so empty uh, in my life. Um, and so it was a year that I think none of us will ever forget. And uh, that's why I, I've been encouraged to write this book, which uh, I've just about finished now, uh, reflections of crazy guy walking across the country to empty ballparks during the pandemic. So, so I actually have two questions uh, left and one of them was going to be about your book. So is there a timeline of when we could expect to maybe see your book? And then also two, if people are interested in just being on that list to hear about when it may be coming out, is there a way they can sign up um, and get more information? Yeah, I'll keep it, I'll keep you all updated at the Alumni Association. I appreciate the interest. Um, like I said, the book is pretty much written. Now we're trying to uh, put together a proposal and we've got that pretty much done and we're starting to shop it to different publishers to see who might have an interest in it. I'm hoping some of the university presses, which like books like this may jump on it. Um, and again, the, the whole purpose of the book is trying to raise awareness and educate the public about the safety crisis we have in healthcare today, not only for those providing care, but those getting care and how to stay safe and how to really support those at the front lines. We've got to figure out how to protect our nurses, our physicians, our pharmacists, so they can do the best job possible and provide the safest care possible. And I hope my book helps raise that awareness. Well, I'm so glad that you put all of your stories into a book because I think there's probably many, many more stories that you weren't able to share with us today that would be fascinating to read and, and hear about. And one of the other questions I didn't ask you was what was the biggest surprise, but I think you sort of answered it in with the happy part of the, the people and how the people came out and what they did and, and responded. Yeah, and the walkers across the world who jumped on and said, wow, I, I like this. It was a little Forrest Gumpish with all of a sudden realizing that there were others who wanted to do what you were doing in a different way. Um, that was very exciting. And truthfully finishing, um, you know, it was very emotional when I got to Jacksonville Beach, Florida, um, if you would have thought, if I would have thought I could have finished this um, when I first was sitting on the couch with that second glass of wine coming up with the idea that, you know, a year later, I will, would have literally walked across this country and, and walked every day for 355 straight days. You know, my shortest day walks were about four and a half, five miles, but the longer ones were 17, 18, 19 miles a day um, during the hottest summers and, and times we've seen. That was one of my highlights was finishing on that beach and being able to remember all those that I had walked for. 
Well, it's, it's just simply incredible. I mean, you know, 19 miles is almost practically a marathon. <laughs> um, and to do that, particularly through the desert of Arizona, which is 120 degrees on a nice day in the summer. I mean, it's just, it's just incredible. So um, thank you so much, Dr. Mayor, for this wonderful conversation and presentation. And thank you for what an impact you had in one year and really to take a pandemic year where it was so hard for so many people and, and turn that around to, to make it a, a good lesson and, and a good uh, awareness campaign. Um, and to really open our eyes to something that everybody needs to be aware of and, and thinking about and taking action on. So thank you so much for all of your incredible work. And, and I can't wait to see what's next. I can't wait to see the book and, and just to see uh, where this takes you. Um, but thank you again, we really appreciate it. Uh, just quickly to uh, close us out here today, please join us for our next alumni exchange program on Wednesday, October 27th, which is next Wednesday at noon Central Standard Time. When we'll be joined by UIC alumna, uh, Megana Bahat, uh, telling your personal story can help you advance your career and personal relationships. Dr. Bahat will teach us and lead us through an interactive session as to why and how implementing storytelling to improve your conversations as she presents the power of storytelling in our everyday lives. To find a recording of this episode and any of our past episodes, please go to go.uic.edu backslash alumni exchange. Uh, and as a reminder, please be on the lookout for that quick survey I mentioned at the beginning. Thank you again, Dr. Mayor. This has been an incredible conversation. You are an incredible human being um, and so grateful for, that you are a graduate and for all of your wonderful work and for joining us today. Thank you to all of you for joining us in Alumni Exchange and we look forward to seeing you at a future Alumni Exchange program. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Stay safe.